last week, we began looking at Christ's parable of the sower and the seed. I gave you this definition of the word parable. The, the, the Greek word is the word parabole, which means, I gave you a long definition, but essentially, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The closest synonym that we would have uh, in, in our usual speak would be a fable. The difference, there, there are differences between parables and fables, but both of them are stories, and the point of the story is the moral, okay? Jesus shares this story, and if all you got was the story with no application, would it be a blessing? Not, not especially. If all you knew was a farmer went out to sow seed, some of it came up, some of it didn't, you'd think, great. Me too. And you'd go home and you'd be unchanged. But Jesus, we're, we're going through now the explanation. Jesus is using an agricultural illustration to make a spiritual point about how individuals receive the gospel when it's presented. We learned in Matthew 13, which is a parallel passage, that Jesus gave this message from a boat that was pushed out from the shore. He gave him a little bit of, of space where he was able to speak. And uh, the, the original social distancing was going on here. As Jesus pushed out away from the shore, give himself a little bit of room so that his voice would carry. When you're, when you're talking and you have people right around you, your voice doesn't go as far. So Jesus creates some room, and now he's able to speak, and his voice is able to carry to all who are there. And he tells the parable. Look at verse 5, and we'll read it just so that we can catch up. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up, and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, that's, that's all. That right there, what we just read, verses 5 down through verse 8, is all that the vast majority of his audience heard. They wouldn't get the explanation. All they heard was an agricultural story. And so they left thinking, why? Why would Jesus push out from shore so that he could share an important message? And then he tells this story that could have happened to any one of us and likely had happened to everyone who has ever planted. Sometimes when you plant your garden this coming spring, you will plant some and some of it won't come up. Some of it will come up. And, and so why would be the question on many of their minds? Again, we, we discuss, so we're just reviewing here. The sower in this day would typically have broadcast sown this field. You have a big bag and just kind of cast it out into a field that had been prepared. The seed falls on several different types of soil. The wayside soil, we mentioned, likely not the roadway. No good farmer would waste good seed on trying to plant the road. But what this would be would be the raised area that would go between the patches. So they would plant a small patch of wheat and then another small patch of wheat. So they were it wasn't just a whole field. It was kind of divided up into sections, and there were... There were little bits of raised area where the farmers would walk between their fields and they would be able to cast their seed. Some of the seed falls onto this area that was packed by the farmer's feet. So while it may have been prepared at one time, now it's not anymore because it's been packed down. The seed that falls on this, this land, uh, it is quickly uh, taken. The birds come along, the birds take the seed. Or it's just, it's, it's just trodden underfoot and it's, it's broken and it's, it's made useless. The second type of soil is the rocky soil. The rocky soil is referring to the rocks that were just below the planted surface. So there was dirt and then there's stones. And so the seed goes and it, it's able to germinate on the, the little bit of soil. But when it goes down and tries to get its roots... It runs into a rock. Now, are there some things that will grow into or through a rock? Yeah, it's kind of neat. Sometimes you see a, a tree that grows and it's got its, its roots, and sometimes it will actually go down and it will break the rock in half. It has just a little bit of a, of a pathway and ends up breaking the rock. We're, not, we're talking about wheat here. It doesn't grow on rocks. 
Okay? And so it goes down and it, it withers away. It doesn't, it's not able to get the nutrients. And so the result of the rocky soil is a quick spring up, only to be followed by a very quick withering away. It doesn't last. Then there's the thorny soil. The thorny weeds would be turned with the soil. When the, when the farmer was plowing, he would, if he was a good farmer, he'd try to prepare his soil. But you know that there's always a few weeds that get through. So there's some weeds, and he turns them under. And then you, then you plant, but you've got, weed, you've got weeds and the seeds of weeds that are there in your soil. And they, they sprout up with your, your crop. Now... In my experience, and it may not be true 100% of the time, but in my experience, weeds grow faster and grow better than crops do. It's, it's amazing how it works, but that's what's going on. So you've got weeds and you've got crops. They're both coming up together, but the weeds grow faster. They steal all the nutrients, and eventually, sometimes they can actually wrap around the, the, uh, the, the crop. You ever had morning glories grow around your tomato vines? They can just cut it off, and, and it doesn't get anything. That's what's going on. So the seeds typically grow fat. The, the weeds typically grow faster than the crop, and they choke out. So again, it springs up, and then it goes away. And then you have the good soil. The good soil is well well prepared soil. Receives the seed, and it gives a hundredfold. That's a good harvest. Even by today's standards, a hundredfold harvest is doing pretty good. Again, all that most got was this part of the parable. But Jesus is going to speak with his disciples. His disciples come to him in verse 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? Lord, why are you telling this story? Why, why would you use this, this venue to get your point across? Most of the people wouldn't get this part. Verse 10, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might see, might, might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now, we have defined, he says, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. When we are talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about believers, the hearts in which God rules. Now, if you come tonight, we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God on earth. We're going to be talking about the millennial kingdom. But right now, where does God rule? Well, he rules in heaven. Where else does God rule? He rules in my heart because I've trusted him as my personal savior. He is Lord in my heart. Okay? Is, is Jesus Lord over, is he the recognized sovereign of planet earth right now? No. No. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Satan has kind of a temporary sway. Now, who is ultimately in control? God is absolutely ultimately in control. But God has given Satan and the, the forces of, of evil and men have free reign. That will end one day and God will set up his earthly kingdom. But right now, he rules in heaven. And he rules in our hearts if we've trusted him. So we're talking about believers. The hearts and minds of those in whom Christ reigns make up the kingdom of God at this time. And this mystery is for those who believe. This mystery, this, this parable is given for those who believe. That's the point. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. A lost person can read the Scripture, and they can appreciate the Scripture as a phenomenal piece of literature. The Bible is second to none in, in just being beautifully written and fantastic literature, from a purely literature point of view. But... A lost person cannot pick up their Bible and without the aid of the Holy Spirit understand the deep meanings of Scripture. It's foolishness to them. Try to explain to a lost person that they that would be first should be last and he that would rule must be servant to all. Does that make sense? Not to a natural mind. 
We understand, if we've trusted the Lord, we understand because we have the Spirit of God who, who ministers to us and reveals to us his word. These mysteries that Jesus is talking about right now, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, are revealed through the help of the Holy Spirit, through his word, to those who believe. In the context of this parable in Luke 8, Jesus' audience was not only his disciples and his apostles, but also there were those who were just hanging around the outside. They were there for the magic show. Well, maybe he'll heal somebody today. Maybe he'll raise, raise somebody from the dead. I heard he did that. We read about that last chapter. There would be a lot of people, if they had a day off work, they'd go see Jesus on the off chance. Maybe he'll raise somebody from the dead. Maybe he'll heal somebody. Maybe he'll feed everybody. We hear he does that sometimes too. And so Jesus would have had a certain amount of celebrity in this day. And so people would have come. So some of those are there. There are people on the outskirts. They're there just for the show. There are religious leaders. Why are they there? Well, they're there to try to catch him. They're listening very, very closely. They're, they're the, the original lawyers. They're there. They're listening real closely. They want to find out. If he says anything that goes against the laws of Moses, or if it goes against our traditions, oh, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. So his crowd is not entirely friendly, is it? Jesus is speaking to some who love him and follow him, some who have given up everything in order to follow him. But he's also speaking to some who are, they're just there for the show. They're just fringe. And Jesus is giving this parable not to the fringe, Jesus is giving this parable to those who believe for a purpose. This portion, the fringe, had willfully hardened their heart against hearing truth. And now Jesus judicially speaks in code to prevent their understanding his message. Jesus is speaking in, in code, in mystery, in order to prevent the, those who are fringe, those who are lost, from understanding this particular message. Now, Jesus doesn't always do this. There are many times when Jesus speaks very directly. You remember when Jesus called the religious leaders, he called them snakes, and hypocrites, and he's just very, very plain. He's not speaking in code, he's laying it very low. But here, he's speaking in, in kind of a code. But we have the interpretation. The divine interpretation is given to us in verse 11. Now, the parable is this, the seed, the word of God. In the context of preaching for the kingdom, the seed is the word of God, meaning it's the gospel, the, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The wayside, we've, we've already dealt with this, so I'm not going into great detail. The wayside, in verse 12, those by the wayside are those that hear then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Remember, wayside soil is the packed soil where the seed couldn't go in. These are people, the wayside soil, are those who hear the gospel and they say, nope, flat rejection, not interested, not interested. We mentioned last week, sometimes these would be the hard net atheists. You go to them and you say, hey, can I share with you what Jesus has done? They say, absolutely not. I don't believe there is a God. And they're, they're closed. But more often, these are going to be the people. You go to them and you say, can I share with you what Jesus Christ has done for me? And they say, nope, I go to church. Nope, nope, I'm good. Nope, my grandfather was a pastor. My, my uncle was a deacon. I'm, I'm good. These wayside, the packed, the packed soil, very often are the religious. They say, I don't need God because I've got my religion. I've got my, I've got my traditions. <clears throat> Remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders. He could say, I've come to give you life. They say, but we've got Moses. We don't need you. And so they flatly reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. This still happens. All of these still happen today. When you go out and you share the gospel with friends, neighbors, co-workers, whoever, you'll find all of these soils represented. As you spread the seed, you'll find this happen. There will be some who say, nope, not interested. The, the, the wayside soil. 
Verse 13. The rocks. They on the rock are they which when they hear it, receive the word with joy. These have no root, for which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. The rocky ground doesn't allow roots to form. The plant withers under the elements. This is a description of one who hears the gospel. They understand it, it makes sense. A good presentation of the gospel is given to them. They hear it. They mentally assent to it. They mentally say, yes, I agree. I agree. That, that would be nice. But they never, they, they never make a genuine profession. They never place their dependence in Christ alone. This passage, and one reason why I take so much time on this passage in Luke 8, is because this passage has been taken out of context by many to say, well, you can lose your salvation. This passage does not teach you can lose salvation. These, these soils didn't have it to begin with. You can't lose what you don't have. They don't have salvation, so they can't lose their salvation because of falling away. That's not what the context is speaking. This, this is the exact opposite of the wayside soil. The wayside soil, the seed falls, and nothing happens. It's trodden underfoot. It's taken by the birds. It's just gone. There's no, there's no acceptance at all. This is... Receive. They, they say, oh, yes. Yeah, I've been looking for this. I've had that said, those exact words to me. When I've shared the gospel with somebody, they say, oh, I've been looking for this. And sometimes they have been. But sometimes they're, they're looking for a good luck charm to help their life get better. We, we've used illustrations. Uh, when, you, when you share the gospel with someone as a cure-all, you say, well, if you accept Jesus, he'll fix all your problems. There's a lot of Christians in this room, and there are a lot of problems represented in this room, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't instantly remove you from all of your problems. Will he solve the big problem? He'll solve your sin problem, mm -hmm. but, but you can have a host of problems, and, and, and getting saved won't make all of them go away. Some people say, well, if you accept Jesus, he'll give you true meaning and purpose, and your problems will be over. That's a, that's, a poor, that's a poor representation of the gospel. Don't do that. You're selling Jesus as a cure-all. Jesus is not a quack remedy to people's problems. Jesus is the savior of their souls. If you were here last week, you remember I mentioned this would be like giving somebody a parachute as they board a plane and saying, if you wear this, it'll make your flight better. No, it won't. It'll make your flight a little bit more cramped. Okay? But, but if you tell someone, by the way, when, when we're about halfway, you've got to jump. They're not going to take off the parachute because it makes them uncomfortable, because it cramps them. They'll say, no, no, I'm, I'm not wearing the parachute to make me comfortable. I'm wearing the parachute because there's, there's a point coming when, when I have to have it. And if you, if you share with people, Jesus, hey, there's a judgment coming. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. If you trust Christ, if you live according to the dictates of this book in 2020, it will cramp your style. It will make you stand out. Believers who live godly, biblical lives look weird in 2020. We're supposed to. The Bible says in 1 Peter that we are to be a peculiar people. Now, some people may take that a bit far and say, I get to be weird. The Bible says so. That's not exactly what the Bible is teaching. We are to behave in such a way as lines up with God's word. And God's word and culture do not match. If you're living according to God's word, you're going to live counterculturally. And when you share the gospel with someone and you say, look, if... I'm not giving you Jesus as a cure-all, as a fix-all for all of your temporal problems. I'm saying one day you're going to stand before God, and if you stand there by yourself, you'll be condemned. But if you stand there in Christ, then you'll be accepted. We're not selling Jesus as the fix, as a, as a, as a rabbit's foot, as a good luck charm, but a lot of people take it. These people, the rocky soil, well, yeah, I'll take Jesus. Yeah, he'd, he'd help. I, I'll add Jesus to, sure, why not? They, they accept it. Sure, I agree, the gospel, yep, that's good. 
Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. There was a, a movement for years of people who would go and they would try to go soul winning. They would go and they would tell other people about the gospel. And there were classes that were taught where they would get you nodding. They'd say, just nod while you talk. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're nodding while they talk to you? Eventually, what do you start doing? You start nodding. You say, would you like to accept Jesus? And they're already nodding. You think I'm joking. I'm not. There are people who taught that. And they thought, well, that's good. Now, they, now they've trusted Jesus. No, they haven't. They may have made a mental ascent. They say, well, if you trust Jesus, all your problems will go away. Would you like to do that? Yes. Yeah. But they've not trusted Christ. They, they, they've accepted. And they spring up fast. But what happens? The first time they face a trouble or a trial, what happens to them? They're gone. Why? But they didn't have it to begin with. They didn't trust Christ. They nodded their head. Or they said, yeah, I think Jesus sounds good. Maybe he'd fix my problems. Jesus isn't a cure-all. Verse 14, we come to the thorns. This is where we got to last week. Verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they had heard, go forth. They grow and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Bring no fruit to perfection. If the rocky soil turned away from the gospel due to trials and pain, then the seed that fell on thorns represents the souls who turn away from the gospel because of pleasure. Both are deadly, aren't they? Pain, some people, they'll never trust Christ because of the, the troubles. Some people will never accept Christ because everything's so good. Pleasures can be, can be deadly. That's exactly what this is. This is the person who's preoccupied with material possessions and the stuff that the world has to offer. They, they know it's true. They know the gospel's true, but they're too busy to make a decision, to make a genuine decision. They have a mental awareness of the gospel, the facts of the gospel. They could, they could walk you through. Jesus came. He was born to a virgin named Mary. We celebrate that around Christmas time. Grew up, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, and now he's in heaven. And there are a lot of lost people who could share that with you. There's a lot of lost people who could walk you down that path. They know the facts, but they're too busy enjoying the good things that life has to offer for them to actually accept what they know to be true. They've accepted with their head. Not with their heart, not with the mental assent, but not true acceptance. I think it was Herb mentioned on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, there are a lot of people who miss heaven by 18 inches, the difference between your head and your heart. There's a lot of people, they know the facts about Jesus, but they're not going to heaven when they die. They, they know the facts. They could, they could tell you this. Yeah, I grew up in Sunday school. I know the stories, but they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Thus, they're not his children. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, we read, But they that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Thorny soil. That they accept, absolutely, I'll take, I'll take Jesus. I, I know about Jesus, but they don't, they never make the decision. They never accept what he has done for them. Again, this passage, thorny, thorny soil, is not teaching that you can lose your salvation. These had never truly accepted Christ to begin with. So thus, you can't lose what you don't have. They've never actually said I'm placing my faith. I'm by grace through faith. They've, they have mental knowledge, but they've never accepted what Jesus has done for them. In Luke 18, we'll get there one of these years, but Jesus is speaking with the rich young ruler who wanted to follow him, but he can't bring himself to renounce his riches. Do you remember this story? This rich young ruler, he wants to follow. He's got, 
He's, he knows this, this is, this Jesus, he's more than just a teacher. He's more than just a rabbi. I'm going to dedicate myself to following him. And he comes to Jesus and he says, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus tells him to leave all of his stuff. And the Bible says that verse 23 of Luke 18, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when they, speaking of his disciples, had heard it, said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Can rich people be saved? Yes. Yeah, thank God for that, right? We, all of us, by the way, are rich by most of the world's standards. Okay? So, praise God that rich people can be saved. He's not just the God of the poor. He's the God of the rich as well. But it's more difficult for those who are rich. Why? Because they don't think they need it as much. I've, I've witnessed uh, for the Lord and, and spread the gospel in, in America. I've also spread the gospel in Asia. Where do you think they have more money? America. In America. It's a whole lot easier to convince someone on a street corner in Manila, in the Philippines, that they need God than it is on Wall Street. Why? Because the person on Wall Street, they many times their God is their checkbook. And they don't feel that they need him because they have so many resources. It's not that it can't be done. Can God pass a camel through a needle's eye? Yeah. <laughs> God can do whatever. Can you pass a camel through a needle's eye? No, not without considerable molecular uh, deconstruction. We can't. But God can. God can save the rich. God can do a work. Verse 15, talking about the good soil. But that on the ground, on, but that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. This is the hearer of the gospel who's ready to receive the good news. They accept it. They embrace it. They trust Christ with with their whole heart, and they bring forth fruit. When, when the Bible says to keep it, that word means to take hold, to retain, to seize. They, they, they hear the gospel and they grab hold of it. And they're not letting go. They're, they're, they, they understand this is the only way of salvation. They, they accept the word of God. And they bring forth fruit with patience, meaning to continually bring forth fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. My wife and I, we planted a garden at our, at our house, and we planted all of the seedlings. And uh, I don't know what some of the baby plants look like. You ever have this problem? So I have, I have weeds that look really nice. I grow nice weeds if you need some. Uh, so we've got weeds coming up, and they're beautiful. And I've got these little... Other things, don't know what they are. Maybe they're what I planted. Maybe they're another type of weed. Do you know what I do usually? I try to wait. I try to let them grow a little bit. And, and eventually, it becomes obvious. This is a bean plant. You know how I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's a bean plant? When it starts growing beans, because sometimes I'm really thick about it. Sometimes, say, well, you, I know that's a bean plant. Well, I know when it starts growing beans. How, how, how do you know good soil? How do you know that it's been received? It starts bearing fruit. Because thorny soil seed doesn't bear fruit. Rocky soil seeds don't bear fruit. Good soil does. Now, what's the difference? What's the difference between good soil, wayside soil, thorny soil, and stony soil? What's the difference? Soil preparation. Can you till wayside soil? Yeah. yeah. 
it would take some work, but we could turn this road into a, into a field, couldn't we? We'd have to do a lot of work. You'd have to rip out the road. You'd have to, you'd have to dig up the dirt from down low. You'd have to, you could do it. It would take a ton of work, but soil pre preparation is the difference in all of these types of soil. Can God soften the soil of a hard heart? Yes. Yes. The wayside soil. God often gives people more than one chance to hear the gospel. How many of you received the gospel the first time you heard it? Some of you probably did. But most don't. Most don't accept it the first time they hear it. Most say, I need to think about it. I need to, I need to, I'm going to talk to somebody about it. Let me read a little bit more. But would that be a, a, a stony soil or a wayside soil? No, it, it's soil that God's working on. Can rocks and weeds be removed? Yeah. What's it take? Work. work. It takes hard work. Yeah, you got to go out and you, if, if you're anything like me, you don't get to weed once, do you? <laughs> you weed lots. You keep weeding because you want to prepare the soil. It is our privilege, those of us who've trusted Christ, it's our privilege to go into the world with the gospel. And if they reject the gospel, if they reject the message of the gospel, we shouldn't go home and say, well, I tried, they're just stony soil. Or we go home, we, we give them the gospel, they say, nope, not interested. We say, well, they're just wayside soil, and we leave. No, no, what should you do? You say, they rejected the gospel. I'm going to pray that God will use me and that God will use his word, that God will use circumstances, that God will, will use his spirit to, to break up that hard-packed ground. There are a lot of people who, when they first heard the gospel, they said, no. The apostle Paul would be a good representation of wayside soil, wouldn't he? Do you figure he received the gospel the first time that he heard it from one of the Christians he was persecuting? Nope. Said, nope, don't need that. I've got, I've got Moses. I've got, I've got the law. I'm a Pharisee. Forget this. But eventually, what happened? Well, on the road to Damascus, God ran a plow through Saul's heart and turned him into Paul, the apostle. Soil preparation makes all the difference. If the gospel is rejected, pray that God will use you. Pray that he'll use circumstances. Pray that he'll use his word. It's amazing what happens when you leave a Bible laying around and somebody reads it. The Bible is the power of God, the Gospels, the power of God unto salvation. And, and there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who have, they say, I'm, I'm a Catholic, and they read their Bible and they realize, wow, there's, there's something here. There's a lot of people, there are, there are Muslims who read God's Word and, and, and the Holy Spirit pricks their heart, and they trust him as a result. They've got a hard heart, but, but they, they are brought to the point where they're able to receive the gospel and grow. Again, you probably didn't accept the gospel the first time you heard it. It probably took a few times. It probably took, probably took some questions. We need to give others the benefit of that when we come alongside and we share the gospel with them and and. We, we need to be careful in, in when somebody comes and, and you're able to talk to somebody and they make a profession of faith. I, I do my very best to never tell somebody, then you're saved. I don't want anybody to go to hell because Pastor Ben told them they're saved. The Spirit of God can witness in their heart that they're saved. Now, I can tell someone... If you trust Jesus Christ, if you do what Jesus says, if you place your dependence in him for salvation, he will save you. Absolutely. We can put a period right there because God does. But I don't come alongside people and say, well, then you're saved. Why? Because I don't want them to depend on me. I want them to depend on Jesus. I want them to depend on, on what, they, what Jesus has done for them, not some words that I've said. It's especially important with children, by the way. I know we have lots of parents and grandparents here. When you, when you get to lead your grandchild in, 
in a prayer accepting Jesus Christ, don't look at them and say, well, now you're saved. Let the Spirit of God do that in their heart. If they've trusted Christ, then, then they will grow. You can say, I'm so happy for what you've done, but just be careful. Be very careful. Because you don't want to, you don't want to solidify in the mind of someone who has not truly accepted Christ. Well, I, I did this when I was little. I trusted Jesus when I was, when I was five. And, and I know I did because my Sunday school teacher told me I did. Or my mom told me I did. Would it be a terrible thing for somebody to, to get into the presence of God depending on what a Sunday school teacher told them? Or, or what a parent told them they did, but they didn't truly accept? We need to be careful of that. Need to be, we need to be, as believers, we need to be involved in soil preparation. And I know that some of you have witnessed and have had a burden for a co-worker, a loved one, and they just don't seem to hear you. That maybe they fall into one of these categories. You'd say, I've got a handful of people on my list. Some of them, they're wayside soil. Every time I go to them, they're just hard. You got some, you'd say, they're, they're stony. Or some, yeah, that's thorny soil. I hope you have some. I hope you've had some who were good soil. It's a tremendous blessing when we can come to someone and we can say, let me share with you what Jesus has done for me. And they say, I'd love to hear it. And you're able to share the gospel and they're able to trust Christ. What a blessing. Are you sowing the word of God by giving it out regularly? Are, are you walking through the fields and keeping all the seed in the bag? If you are, you know what kind of harvest you're going to have? Not a great one. Okay? We need to be sowing. We need to be giving the gospel to those we come in contact with on a regular basis. Are you discouraged? Maybe you are this morning. Maybe, you've, maybe you, you talked to a loved one or a neighbor and they told you to get lost. I'm not interested in your Jesus. Don't be discouraged. The, the, their heart, their, their soil needs a little more preparation. But God can do it. God can, God can get rid of the stones. God can plow deep and break up the packed ground. Perhaps there's somebody here today, and you'd identify as one of these souls. You'd say, you know what? I, I made a decision. I've, I've mentally assented. I've mentally agreed with the gospel, but I've never personally accepted what Jesus has done for me on the cross. Th then today's the day. Today's the day. If you realize that, then today's the day. Trust Jesus today as your personal Savior. I've given you the illustration. My mom fell into this category for the majority of her life. My mom grew up in a, in a pastor's home. She grew up. She went to Bible college. She married a pastor, my father. My mom got saved when she was after my wife and I had gotten married. My mom led me to the Lord when I was little. But she had never, she knew enough of the gospel to share it with others. But she had never made the transition from a head, a head knowledge. She knew about Jesus. But I remember the day my mom called me. I was driving home from work. And my mom called. She said, Ben, I, I got saved today. And, and I, you, you know how angry I got with her? I didn't get angry with her at all. I said, Mom, that's great. That's fantastic. And if you're here this morning and say, everybody here thinks I'm saved, I guarantee you, if you haven't trusted Christ and you do today, everybody who thought you were saved will be so happy. They'll be, they'll be thrilled for you. Because why? Because it's a terrible thing to, to know that you don't know. To, to, to have all of those doubts, get them taken care of. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, you've only ever, you'd say, I'd know all about him. I could, I could walk you through the gospel. But you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. You've never taken him and accepted him personally. Then do it today. Don't, don't, don't mess around. Eternity is too long to mess around with. Do it today. If you'd like to talk to somebody, I'd love to talk with you. If you're a lady, my wife would love to talk with you. God has prepared the soil of your heart and you're ready to receive him, then don't put it off. Because the thing about prepared soil is if you leave it long enough, what happens? It'll grow weeds again. 
and it'll get packed down again. If God's doing a work, then you need to do business with God. But I know that most of you in here have trusted him as your personal Savior. Are you sowing? Are you involved in soil preparation? If you've been sowing and you're not seeing the harvest, Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, brother or sister in Christ who's going forth with the gospel, keep sowing. You say, I, don't see, I haven't seen a harvest. Keep sowing. It, don't allow the fact that you haven't seen a harvest in a little while make you stop sowing. Okay? If I got angry next year that my, my garden last year didn't do what I wanted it to, I said, I'm just not planting a garden. What do you think? What kind of harvest am I going to have? None. If you don't plant, you don't harvest. We reap what we sow. And if you don't sow, then you won't reap. Sow the gospel. Be involved in preparing the soil. Because you know what? The, the thing that's really neat about this is Brother Terry, he might go and he shares the gospel with somebody and they say no. And I go alongside. I don't, I don't know that Terry's talked to him. And I go and I share the gospel with him. And this time they say, huh, that's interesting. And, and then Sid comes along. And Sid shares the gospel with him. And, and they say, you know what? I, I think this is right. I think this is something that I need to do. Now, if Terry would have gotten mad and I would have gotten mad, what would have happened? They wouldn't have got saved. Be used. Not everybody harvests. Some of us plant. Some of us water. Some of us reap. Let's be used in God's harvest. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? here this morning, you haven't trusted Christ. You'd say, you know what? I know you weren't preaching a gospel message per se, Pastor, but I, I feel convicted. I've never trusted Christ. Today's the day. Don't leave without getting it taken care of. I'll be at the back. I I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise, but I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to sit down with the Bible and show you how you can know 100% that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, that you can have peace with God right now love to talk with you. If you're here this morning, you'd say, I've trusted Christ. I'm positive. I know that I've trusted Christ. I know he's my Savior. Then are you busy? If you are, if you are sharing the gospel, then you are without a doubt seeing all of these different types of soils. Are you busy? Are you sharing the gospel? And are you allowing the Lord to use you not only in sowing, but also in soil preparation? Because that's important. If you don't prepare the soil, then you won't have a harvest. Are you allowing God to use you? Our Father, we thank you for being the God of the harvest. Lord, we ask that you would send forth laborers. Lord, that you would send forth us into your harvest. You've said that the harvest is, is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Lord, I pray that, that we would be willing to be used. Lord, if there's one here this morning who's never trusted you as their personal Savior, I pray that they wouldn't leave here, that they wouldn't rest until they've taken care of you. But Lord, for those of us who have, I pray that we would be faithful in sharing the gospel, in preparing the soil, and in allowing you to do a work that only you can do. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.